praise the Lord. Um, the Lord is revealing to me that there's one here who has such a deep, deep hurt, has been hurt so deeply that you're tired of waiting. You're about ready to give up and throw in the towel. To, oh, this is not going to work. The Lord wants you to know that in this darkest hour in your life, you've never experienced anything like this before. In your darkest hour, he is the closest to you. Just do not give up. The Israelites waited all night for the sea to open up when the enemy was chasing them. Can you imagine? The enemy is not chasing you. The Lord opened up the sea in the morning. And your sea is about to open up. Don't give up. Sometimes we give up just before the victory. Stand firm and praise him for what he's about to do. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that you speak to your people. Lord, we thank you for that word of encouragement. Lord, that you see and you hear and you act. Lord, we thank you that you're here today and we thank you for this season, this Christmas season, what it means. Lord, you came to earth to make a way. You came to earth to get involved in our situation, to get involved in our circumstances. To become a personal savior to us. And right now, Lord, we just invite you into this place. We invite you into our lives. And we ask you, God, to have your way. Have your way here. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. You know what? When I was... I've been going to church for a long time, and I always said, I'm never going to do this. If I ever start preaching, I'm never going to do this, because I'm very introverted. We're going to dismiss the older kids now for Sunday school. Let's see, Sean's going. He's the oldest kid going, so he's also the most immature person that's going to be up there this morning. So we, um, I'm very introverted, so I always hated when I'd go to a service somewhere, or a conference or whatever, and I'm sitting beside a total stranger, and the preacher would say, hey, turn to your neighbor and give him a hug, or, you know, and it was like, I don't know this person, and I don't want to give them a hug. And then I'd be like, very hesitant, and then I'd give him a hug, because I didn't want to be the jerk who didn't give the guy next to me a hug. I'm not going to say give your neighbor a hug, but you know what, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you know what, cheer up, God is good. Turn to your neighbor, cheer up, God is good. You can hug if you want. You know, we just, we seem a little bit uh, quieter than usual. Hey, Lester, do you notice that? Yeah. You notice that, Brian? Yeah. A little subdued today, but that's okay, because God is still God, and God is still good. This morning, uh, I woke up, and I got some news. You guys remember, uh, I don't know, maybe about, Two months ago or so, I can't remember the exact date, uh, Danny was playing drums and I brought him down and I, I asked us to, that we, I asked you if you'd be willing to commit to pray for Danny over this next year and many of you raised your hands. Do you remember that? Um, so I got the news this morning that Danny's dad passed away overnight and so we just need to pray for Danny. We need to really live up to that commitment. Uh, I don't know why the Lord asked me to make that declaration but obviously Danny needs our support. And, we, you know, all the young people need our support. But right now, today, Danny needs our support and prayers. I was texting with Danny this morning. He said, I'm going to be watching online this morning. And so I told Danny, we're going to pray for you. So we're going to do that right now. Just remember Danny in your prayers. Well, I'm sure we're going to see him in church in the next few weeks. And you know what? I'm, you know, you know what would be really neat? Is that if some people would just go out and buy Danny something, a gift, an encouragement. And when he comes into church, you see him in church, you just give it to him. Hey, hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you and I'm standing with you. But why don't you join your hearts with me this morning. Danny, we, I just want to look into the camera and say, Danny, we love you. And we, we're praying for you and we will hope to see you back here really soon. Father, we just, uh, we just thank you for your word in this time. And this, 
In moments like this, God, there's nothing in the natural that we can do. But we know your word is alive. And we know your word is powerful. Lord, and we know the plans that you have for Danny. Good plans. Plans to prosper him, not to harm him. Plans to give him a hope in the future. Lord, your word says that you're a father to the fatherless. And I just declare in this time, Lord, that you would just make yourself so real to Danny. God, that you would just reach into his hurt. You'd reach into his life right now. And God, you would minister to him by your love and your mercy and your grace. God, that you just speak to him. Lord, let him know that he is loved and he is cared for. And just be with him in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, we have other people. I, it's funny, I've been texting with people this morning. I was texting with Paul Vandenberg this morning because he's in uh, London, Ontario, visiting his family. You know, about, you know the thing about Paul is, if you're on Facebook, you see his, his poetry. And uh, it's pretty amazing. And so I'm, I'm looking into the camera right now, right now and I'm saying to Paul, I think you should write a poem for December 22nd about Christmas and then share it here in church. And since I'm asking in front of everybody across the world who's watching us live streaming, we got tens of viewers right now. You really, if you don't, if you don't uh, step up to the plate, everybody's going to make fun of you. Paul and I have this very weird relationship because we both have an addiction. And we are addicted to thrift store shopping, Paul and I. My whole outfit, everything I'm wearing today is from a thrift store. And uh, no word of a lie. I go shop, if Paul goes shopping, he will text me from Value Village. He'll be, oh, like, what size jeans do you wear? Because I think I found a pair that I think will uh, fit you. Or... <laughs> so one day I was, I was in the Salvation Army, and uh, I saw this really cool jacket, and I wanted to buy it, but it was way too big for me. And I'm like, man, this would look good on Paul. And then I look over, and there's December. And I'm like, so I go over to December. I said, you need to buy that jacket for Paul. And she did. So we're, you know, it's just kind of a weird relationship. It's kind of like a little bit of a bromance. I think he's, te yes. He is. Is your volume muted? The sound man is texting me. Is your volume muted? I sure hope not. No, it's working. I'm on. Oh, on my phone? Yes, it is. No. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so shout out to Paul. I also want to send a shout out to John Groot, who's probably watching online in uh, Alberta. He's going to be preaching here in a couple weeks. Just love that guy, and I'm excited to hear him preach in a couple weeks, and I'm happy that he's going to be home for the holidays. So, how's everybody doing? You all doing okay? All right, good, good. So, uh, how many of you who have been here since the cannery, been to Cheers, you know, back in the cannery? Okay, over, over the years, I've, been, I've preached some different sermons, Probably one of the most different sermons I've ever preached was, uh, Brian, I believe it was one of your f first Sundays at Cheers. I preached a sermon called The Cowboy Mentality. Does anybody remember that sermon? Okay, I used clips from uh, Tombstone, one of my all-time favorite movies. Tombstone, it's about Wyatt Earp. The reason I preached that sermon is because I wanted to name my son Wyatt. And so I was trying to manipulate my wife into agreeing with me. <laughs> And it worked, obviously it worked because we named Wyatt Wyatt. But I love, I, it's based on that character uh, in um, that wider movie Tombstone. Because I want my son just to be adventurous and uh, step out in and, and the things of God and just kind of have that cowboy mentality. Just go after God and throw caution to the wind and fight for justice. And so that's kind of why I named him that. And I'm, it was pretty funny because uh, a couple days ago, we were watching the Christmas story. You guys remember that? It's a very famous Christmas story. It was filmed in the 80s. It's about the kid who wants the Red Rider BB gun. You guys remember that story? And uh, so we were watching that with the, with the kids uh, this week. And there's in this uh, movie, you got the main character. And he's kind of, throughout the movie, he's being bullied by this, this kid. He's just kind of following him around, constantly bullying him. And at one point, the main character snaps. And he's being bullied, and he just charges the bully, and he, he knocks him down. He starts beating him up. He gives him a bloody nose. And so Faith, my little peacemaker, she's like, she turns stuff. She's in, she's in elementary school, so she's been learning about bullying and conflict resolution and stuff at school. And she turns to Amanda, and she says, Mom, he shouldn't have done that. He, he should have talked to an adult, and he should have, like, uh, you know, tried to get some help. And 
Then Wyatt just turns, he turns and looks at me and he goes, Dad, sometimes you just got to take him down. <laughs> so, he, so he's really living up to his name, so I'm really enjoying that. But that was, so that was my first sermon I ever preached about cowboys and the cowboy mentality. And then I think I preached like four or five sermons about cowboys and the cowboy mentality, uh, different uh, aspects. I preached one a while back about, on Toby Keith. You guys know, most of you don't know country music. You guys should learn about country music. It's the great, it's the best. So Toby Keith, he sings two songs. He says, he sings, uh, I should have been a cowboy, right? And uh, I should have been a cowboy. It's really good. And um, so he's talking about, I wish I was a cowboy, right? And so, and then he sings another song and it's called, uh, How Do You Like Me Now? He's like, How do you like me now? Right? And so you know, we can live in regret or we can just be confident. How do you like me now? It, that was a sermon you probably don't remember. I remember it. I love that sermon because I got to uh, dress up like a cowboy. And then I preached probably one of my favorite ones was uh, based on the Garth Brooks song, The River, right? You got, nobody remember. You guys, come on. That's a good song. Garth Brooks, greatest, greatest country singer of all time, bar none. And... Uh, you know a dream is like a river. You remember that song? Anybody? Okay. And so I preached on that song. Uh, my whole sermon was based on that song. And uh, it's been a long time since we've seen Cowboy Dennis. <laughs> and so I think it's time. And, uh, you know, uh, you can't do Cowboy Dennis without... Uh, cowboy hat. So, hey Rick, Rick, this hat is not as nice as yours, Rick, but it's okay. And so, I got a song that I would like Greg to play. This is a little bit John Michael Montgomery, Life's a Dance. I could be here all day, right? John Michael Montgomery, that's, I knew all the words. I'm not just pretending I like country music, okay? I'm out of the closet. I love country music. We could do a little uh, dust on the bottle or something. That would be fun. I like that one. But we can't because it's about wine. So, I got an analogy, obviously. An analogy about a 14-year-old kid who's got a crush on the, the blue-eyed girl in his homeroom class. Have you ever been there, guys? Come on. Some of you are like 40. I'm there right now, you know. It's, like, it's, uh, it's, that, it's that awkward place of desiring to go forward in something, but having to face your fear um, to get to where you want to go. I remember um, in high school, you know, it's a high school song. It's about 14-year-old kids, and and what happens when you're 14? Well, if you're me, you, you get like acne, right? You're 14 and, and uh, you get a, you know, a breakout of whatever, acne, a blemish or something. And all of a sudden now, you want to ask the girl out, but you got this massive boiler right here. And it's like you got like, uh, all of a sudden it's like you got a second head. You know, and you, you can't, the whole time you're like trying to talk to the girl, you're thinking, man, and she's just looking right at that zit. You guys, you know what that's like. Come on. Don't, we've all been there. You know, and so we, don't, we let our blemishes hold us back. So we won't leave the house, especially when you're a teenager. You get a, you get a blemish, you get a zit. You're like, I'm not leaving the house. I'm just staying here all night. Uh, sure, I'd like to go to the dance. Sure, I'd like to ask her out. But I got this zit or I got this blemish so there's no way I can do it I can't step out and ask her out so here's my first point this morning it's very deep and it's going to challenge you you got a zit so what <laughs> pretty good eh <laughs> you have a blemish so I'm talking about I'm talking about uh, I'm using the analogy of a, a a young boy who has a crush on a girl that he has to to look at every day going oh she's so beautiful but I'll never be able to go with her but you know what I want to take this into the kingdom of God because a lot of us we look at ourselves and we say I got a blemish or I got an issue and so I want, to, I want to step out in the things of God or I want to be used by God, but I've got this blemish or I've got this issue, so I'm disqualified or God can't use me. 
Abraham, the father of the faith, struggled to believe God's promise his whole life. He struggled. He had a struggle of faith. He had a crisis of faith. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 17, it says, Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I be a father at the age of 100, he thought. Here's the, this is, it. This is what we call him, the father of the faith, struggling with belief. But in Galatians, it says, in the same way, Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness because of his faith. He got past, he worked through his issue, he worked through his unbelief, and, and he became a man who was known as a man of faith. Jacob was named a deceiver at birth, and he lived up to, to that name. He was known for all these deceptions in, in the biblical history. It's all recorded there. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 24 to 28, it said that Jacob was left alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and reached out, wrenched, out it out, wrenched it out of his socket. Then the man said, let me go, for dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you'll be called Israel because you fought with God and with men and have won. Jacob had a character issue. He had a flaw in his character. And he, what he did was deceive. What he did was lie. And he, but he had an issue and he got a hold of God. And he said, God, I'm going to wrestle with you and I won't let you go until you bless me. Jacob could have said, I'm disqualified. Uh, there's no way God can use me. But he got, yeah, he had an issue. But God was greater than his issue. And when he finally got a hold of God, he said, I'm not letting you go. God, I will not let you go until you change me. I will not let you go until you do something in my life. And what did God do? He changed his character and he changed his name. God, the church, the world is waiting for a church that will wrestle with God and say, God, I will not let you go until you bless me, until you change me. He had a character issue. And he could have been disqualified. David sent a friend to his death and stole his wife. But in Acts, the New Testament says David served God's purpose in his generation. David could have, David could have spent the rest of his life saying, I have a sin issue. I've made mistakes that can never be forgiven. I've made, there's, there's, there's no future for me with God because look at the mess I've made. But we read that great psalm that David wrote of repentance. Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Listen, he, he understood that God's grace was greater than his mistake. I could bring thousands of burnt offerings, oh God, but you don't, want, you don't desire that. Lord, what the sacrifice you desire, oh God, is a broken and contrite heart. You do not despise. David had issues. And those issues could have held him back from the dance with God. Peter struggled with fear and denied Christ three times. Then we read in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. And he proceeds to preach a message. And in verse 41, it tells us 3,000 people were saved. They, Peter struggled with fear. And fear could have held him back. Every single one of these men are counted as heroes of the faith. Every single one of them, we would look at them and we put them on this pedestal and say they're almost not even human. But they, listen church, they have blemishes. They have issues. And those issues could have held them back. Abraham, oh, I don't have enough faith. Jacob, I, I have character flaws. David, I, I have sin issues. Peter, I got fear. Fear. 
So what I'm saying is, if you're not perfect, you're in some really good company. If you've got issues that you can't, you can't seem to get through or that are just kind of dogging you and the enemy keeps reminding you about those things, I want you to know that you are amongst the greats. There's nobody in this room that can't be used by God in amazing ways. My grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in your weakness. That's the testimony of all these men that I just shared. The weaker you are. It's like God's looking for somebody who, who realizes, hey, I, I'm not perfect. Because I can use you. Let me pour my power into your weakness. And let's, let's change the world. You're not disqualified. Not by your past. Not by your struggle to believe in hard times. Not even by your character flaws. Oh, others will disqualify you. But God looks at you and says, you're the perfect candidate. For my anointing. So you got a zit, so what? My second point this morning is uh, no guts, no glory. I never did ask, and she moved away. That sucks. Man, I. I've been, I've been crushing on this girl for like two years, trying to get the courage together, and I never did ask, and I never got the opportunity. No guts, no glory. What if Abraham never believed God? What if Jacob got tired of wrestling and gave up before the blessing? What if David said God, great, God's grace isn't sufficient for, for him and he gave up because of his past mistakes? What if Peter continued to live in fear and never preached on the day of Pentecost? They all had what we would consider legitimate issues to pack it in. Those are some pretty big questions. What if? What would the world look like if all those men just said, I can't do it because of such and such? Because of my issue, because of my character flaw, because of my sin, because of my fear, I'm not going to do what I'm called to do. What would the world look like? Those are pretty big questions, but here's the biggest question that I have for you this morning. What if you settle for where you're at right now? The point is, there's greatness in each and every one of us. Because we're child, we're the children of the king. And he's placed things in us. And the enemy takes our mistakes and he, this is what the enemy does. He is the accuser and he points a finger at you. He points out all your flaws. He knows how to get you where you're, where, where you're weakest. And he, because he's afraid of what if they don't settle. What if there's an Abraham in this room this morning? What if there's a David in this room? What if there's a Jacob in this room? What if there's a Peter in this room? We'll never know if we continue to settle for where we're at. It's time to start dancing. Start dancing the dance with the Lord. He calls you his bride for a reason because he's in love with you. Blemishes and all.
We're coming to the end of 2013, and it's going to be 2014. Can you believe that? It's crazy. We're living in a day and an age where the church needs to embrace adventure. Where we got to stop playing it safe. Where, the, where we need to show the world, look, we're, we're just a bunch of imperfect people, but his, per, his power is just made perfect in our weakness, and we just begin to allow God to just have his way in our lives, and we step out in new and exciting ways. But that's my third point. You have to step out of your comfort zone. Trying to find the courage to ask her out was like trying to get oil from a water spout. Courage. What did, what did, what did uh, God command day, Joshua when Joshua was, was told to go into the promised land? He was said, he was commanded, be strong and courageous. The command of the Lord to a man who was called was, I command you, be strong. I command you, be courageous. This, if you're going to be a man of God or a woman of God, there's got to be strength and courage in you. And it's not a natural strength. It's not a, the Bible says those who hope in the Lord will never be disappointed. Our strength and our courage come from our belief in a God, our, God our Father who loves us and he's going to come through for us. Second Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of love, power, and self-discipline. The 14 year old kid in the song, he has a choice. I can relate to this 14 year old kid because I once was 14. I could sit here all day and play Mario Brothers because back when I was 14, it was Nintendo, like the original. And I could eat potato chips and I, you know, covered in crumbs, and, and I, could, I, I could sit there all day. And I could sit there all night, and I did. Joe is my witness. As Joe is my witness, I could play Mario Brothers for 15 hours straight. I, rap, I beat Mario Brothers on the regular Nintendo with one guy. I never died once. I did like 100 levels. You, you, you have to invest a lot of time to get that good. <laughs> I was unbeatable in NHL 94. No one could be, why? Because no one played as much as me. Because that was my comfort zone. I was very introverted. And so I could sit there and I could, I could stay in that place of comfort, which is me and the TV, and no one, you know, I wouldn't have to be in an awkward position. I wouldn't have to try to, like, carry on a conversation. I wouldn't have to do anything that made me uncomfortable. I could just sit there in my sweats and my Wayne Gretzky t-shirt, and I could eat potato chips, and I could play video games for the rest of my life. And I would have been comfortable. But I could step out of that comfort, and I could see what else God had in store for me. Church, we're just, we, we can't just sit in this place of comfort. We find our little niche in the church or our little niche in, in the kingdom of God where we, and I'm comfortable and I'm good and that's what it's going to be for me. But I didn't want to be 40, well, I'm 39 now, and playing Mario Brothers for 10 hours a day. So I had to get some courage and I had to get up and I had to ask the girl to the dance. Because you can't marry video games. You got to step out of your comfort zones. You'll never know the hidden gifts and talents God's placed in you until you step out of your comfort zone and try something new. Like, seriously, I was talking to my Chris Corfield. We were working together on Friday. He goes, Dennis, you always talk about how quiet and introverted you were and how scared you were, but I find it so hard to believe. I didn't know I could preach until I got up and I preached. Like I could read books about it, 
I could watch it on TV. I, you know, I could, I could even go to school. There's a million things I could do, but I didn't know that I had, God had placed a gifting in me until I got up and I faced my fears. The first time I ever preached, I never slept the whole night. And then I didn't know if when I got onto that stage, if I was going to freeze. I didn't know if I was going to stutter. I didn't know if I was going to, I didn't know how it was going to go. But there was an anointing and there was a calling and it was only discovered when I put myself in an uncomfortable place and I, I risked it all. You see, you'll never know if God's going to use you to, in the healing ministry until you step out and you pray for somebody who's sick. You can read books about healing. You can go to conferences. But the real test is, are you going to step out and risk failure? You'll never know if you can lead worship. You might be able to sit at home and strum on your guitar and, 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 and you know, you might be musical, but you'll never know if you're going to be able to lead worship until you step out and you take a risk. You're never going to know if you can prophesy until you open your mouth and speak. You see, we, unless we're willing to step out of our comfort zone, we, I mean, we can sit here every Sunday for the next 40 years and we can, we can listen to preaching and we can, we can love the music and we can say, this is my home church. But God has more for, for every single one of us than just sitting here being entertained. See, I believe we have Abrahams here and Davids and, and Jacobs and Peters, but... For whatever reason, we're not stepping out. See, you'll never know what it's like to experience freedom and worship. I remember the first time I just entered into worship because I was always afraid of what everybody thought of me. But when I entered into worship and I was, dan you know, this, I was dancing and everything, I was so, I experienced such a freedom, but I had to step out. And I'm not a good dancer. Hey, I'm not even a good singer, but I do it sometimes. It's a risk. You think it's not a risk getting up here and preaching sermons like this in a cowboy hat and singing country songs? But I want to, at the end of the day, I want to stand before God and say, hey, Lord, I tried. Like one day I'm going to stand before God and I want to say, well, Lord, I just played it safe. Lord, I was afraid to try new, try new things. Or That's not what I want for my testimony. I got some pictures I'd like to show you. I think that's the next one, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Oh, there it is. So, a couple weeks ago, oh, Christy preached, and she got up, and she's like, oh, everybody had a crush on Joe. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you they didn't have a crush on. <laughs> See, I can relate to that, that, uh, that 14-year-old kid in the song, because there's, there's, there's little Dennis there. You know, I know what it's like to have blemishes. You know, I could have let the buck teeth stop me. I could have let the afro kind of have its way. You can't see it in that picture, but there's a big toothpaste stain right there. And, and, and Amanda doesn't know that, that I, I'm showing her picture this morning. Look at that, she's hot. <laughs> See, at some point, I could have, I could have, like, look at young Dennis. He's about as dorky as they come. <laughs> and I, and I could have just said, you know what, all this dorkiness, there's no way that I can step out and I can ask that, that beautiful girl to the dance. I, I had to step out. There was a million reasons why I didn't think Amanda would go out with me. Uh, you can find a million reasons from that picture alone. <laughs> but I, I stepped out. What if you step out? What if you step out in, in the kingdom of God? Sure, you got blemishes. You face your fears, you... You push those aside and you ask the girl to the dance and she says yes? That's sweet.
I mean, what's the worst that can happen, right? I mean, she could have laughed at me and she could have said no. Been knocked down by the slamming door. Picked myself up and came back for more. Well, you ask one pretty girl out, she says, no, just go find another pretty girl and ask her out. <laughs> the point is, you never know. Eventually, one's going to say yes. You, you, try, you try a ministry or you try something in the kingdom of God and, and maybe it doesn't work out. Well, that's not the end. God bless you for trying. It didn't work. It's not, not a good fit for you, but try something else because God's got something for you. It's like we, I watch all these mining shows now like uh, Yukon Gold and all these. You know what they do? They, they go and they mine ground because they believe there might be something there. And then they mine it for like six months and they find out there's nothing there. They just go to another piece of ground and say the gold's going to be down here and I'm going to mine there. You've mined a few places that didn't work out. Don't give up. Try something else. Because there's gold there. There's hidden, hidden treasures in you that God has placed there. The worst that she can say is no. And maybe tell her friends, and it might be on Facebook and stuff now. But back in the day, I didn't have to worry about Facebook. <laughs> Pick yourself up. Try again. I mean, we didn't know we could plant a church until we stepped out and tried planting a church. Lo and behold, here we are. And in this church, we've tried a lot of crazy things. Some worked and a lot didn't. And I just say, God, you know, we were trying. We took a risk there, God. It didn't work out. Oh, well, let's pack her in. It didn't work. No, we'll try something else. Do something different. Put a cowboy hat on, dance around, sing. I just want to try something, God. I just want to, I want to, I want to explore. I want to see what, what, you know, Lord, what are the possibilities here? So you might have to crawl even after your walk. It might sting for a little bit. You failed. I'm going to get her next time. It's not the end of the world. Why are we so afraid of failure? I mean, we're going to stand before God, and he's going to say, hey, I like the, I, I, you guys were adventurous. You, you tried things. You know, you, you ticked a few people off, but that's okay because your hearts were in the right place. You wanted to try something new. You wanted to try something different. You wanted to get the gospel out in a new way. It's, it's okay. I mean, yeah. I've asked the question, what's the worst that can happen? But here's a better question. What's the best that can happen? Yeah. This was all possible because the dorky little kid took a risk. <laughs> it's true. If I had let fear hold me back, and if I would, fear of rejection, fear of being hurt, fear of, fear of whatever. This, this is what happened. Step, I, I stepped out, I took a risk. She was way too good for me. All the things that I, 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 I could have said to myself. I had other relationships that didn't go so well. She wasn't my first girlfriend, believe it or not. It's hard to believe, isn't it? I've been hurt. I'm never going to put myself out there again. No. Because God had this for me. He had this beautiful family, these, these kids. And a little, little faith, she's at home sick right now with the flu. But... all happen when we take a risk. You see, Abraham, he became the father of the faith. For Jacob, God changed his name, and more than that, he changed his character. For David, his legacy could have been 
the man who failed. But he picked himself up and he, he came back to God and he was, his legacy is a man who served his purpose in his generation. For Peter, he became the rock on which the church was established. Every single one of these men could have quit. Every single one of these men could have disqualified themselves. And that's what the enemy wanted. But a more important question today is what's it going to be for you? What's life going to be for you on the other side of your issue? What's a life going to be like for you on the other side of your perceived failure? Don't worry about what you don't know. Life's a dance you learn as you go. We've learned from our mistakes. We still make, we make new mistakes. Just, that's the great thing about mistakes. They're, they're there to be made. Like, but you, you learn as you go. This is, an, this is a great adventure. The, the kingdom of God cheers the church. The whole thing is this grand adventure. And we don't get to, we don't get to exactly know how it's going to look. But if we play it safe, it's going to look like this forever. There's greatness in each and every one of us. Not because we're inherently, you know, we, we got all these talents and abilities. It's because God looks at us and he says, you know what? I see your blemish. But I love you with an everlasting love. And I've drawn you with loving kindness. And I've got a plan and a purpose and a hope and a future. And my grace is greater than your blemish. It's like the best cover-up for a zit that ever existed. He just wants to take you, raise you up, set you on this great adventure. And he wants to turn this town upside down. So, don't worry about what you don't know because you're going to learn as you go. But my challenge to you is just to take risks. This morning, I'll get the worship team back. and uh, dear, uh, Brian, can you play Life's a Dance? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to finish with a, a song. and I, I believe that this is a word from the Lord, and I believe that uh, God has been speaking to you and challenging you even as, as the speaking has been going on. I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to invite... You, you know, we talk, I talked about the Holy Spirit a couple days ago. When we pray, when we invite the Holy Spirit in, what he does is he, he convicts. He convicts of Jesus. He convicts of sin. He convicts uh, of the presence of the Lord. And I'm going to ask him to just, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and in this time. Begin to just show us. Look, here's areas that you can step out in. Here's, you know, to start giving us an inkling of, some of those hidden talents and treasures that are deep inside of us that we've kind of buried because of, for whatever reason. And this time, just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and then I'll come and close the service off. Father, we just, we thank you for the great adventure of life with you. Lord, we want to be in this dance with you. We want to, we want to just, we want to step out of just existing. And we want to start thriving with you, God. Lord, many of us are held back by different issues. For some of us, it's unbelief, God. I pray you would help our unbelief. Lord, for some of us, there's deep character issues that we haven't been able to, 
to overcome, Lord. I pray that there would be a wrestling, God, that there would be just this determination that would settle in our spirits that, Lord, we're not going to let you go until you bless us. We're not going to let you go, God, until you change us. Lord, nothing is impossible with you. You are greater than any flaw in our character. Lord, I, I, so for some of us, it's been, uh, we, we've fallen into sin or we've had, we've, we've had a past that we feel we just can't overcome. I thank you, Lord, that your blood covers us. I thank you that your blood cleanses us. I thank you that your grace is sufficient for us, God. For some of us, fear has held us back our whole life. Fear of failure, fear, fear of man. But God, I thank you you have not given us a spirit of fear. But as, we, as Christians, you've given us love, power, and a sound mind. So Holy Spirit, in this time, God, I pray that you would speak to your people. And God, that you would, be, you would challenge us by your spirit for 2014. In Jesus' name.